Good morning. We're really glad you be here with us to this morning. Now we go read the Bible. Could you raise up, please? In Luke 12, 22 to 26. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider a ravens, they do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you, will, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Dear Heavenly Father, our hope in you is firm and secure. Not because our faith is strong, but because you're faithful to, to do as you promised. Help us, Lord, to surrender to you freely today and experience your life and peace. Shine your vibrant light of love in and through our lives so we can give honor to the Father and encourage others to put their trust in you. We have prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So this week was Groundhog's Day. I don't know if you heard, but Puxatawney Phil did not see his shadow, which uh, means apparently that we could have an early spring. So I think that this, this uh, tradition of Groundhog's Day, it's cute, right? It's cute, it's harmless, it's not scientifically accurate, but cute and harmless. However, however, there are, there are some things that are cute but deadly, right? Let's just think about a few things in our world, particularly in the animal kingdom, that are cute but deadly, okay? So the red kangaroo. The red kangaroo, especially if you see that little joey peeking out of the mama's pouch, super adorable. But if you get too close to her, she will kick you to death with her strong legs. Okay, the platypus. Awkwardly cute, right? Awkwardly cute, the beak of a duck, the legs of an otter, and the tail of a beaver. However, the males have these spurs on their hind legs that they can sting you with that are venomous. Cute, but deadly. Okay, the puffer fish. The puffer fish, chubby, adorable when it's puffed up, but it is the second most, uh, it's the second most poisonous vertebrate on the planet. The poison of the puffer fish has no antidote, and it kills a little grody here. It kills by paralyzing the diaphragm, causing suffocation. Cute, but deadly. And one more. Look at this guy. Its eyes, its eyes are adorable. Okay, but this animal called the slow loris has a gland near its elbow that secretes a substance that can cause reactions from itchy skin to convulsions to anaphylactic shock you're gonna die. Okay, so cute but deadly. So what does that have to do with our sermon series? Well, we're in this series called Isms, and today's ism is consumerism. And consumerism, when you first hear of it, you may think, but pastor, how bad can it be? Well, I think this is a cute but deadly kind of habit that we can get ourselves into. It seems innocent enough, but it actually is deeply harmful. Okay, so what is consumerism? Well, for a basic definition, according to Got Questions, consumerism is a preoccupation with consuming more and more goods, merchandise, and services. It's, it gets us into the mentality of having the best having the, the latest, having the most, but also just about having more. 
and more and more. Now you may be thinking, but pastor, haven't, hasn't the world always kind of been a world of consumers? Well, I, I think we could make a case that throughout history, the ultra-rich have been consumeristic throughout history. But for the majority of people, while we have always had trading, bartering, borrowing, buying and selling, there's not been the widespread culturally endemic problem of consumerism that we have today. So when did it change? Well, it changed when mass production began because mass production allowed for things to be made in a way that were more accessible to the common people. And so this idea of having new things, more things, better things took hold. Then specifically in the 1950s and 60s in areas of the world where there were already electricity and then TVs and things, uh, the ability for advertisers to sell us on a vision of more, more, more took hold. They were able to get these new products in front of our eyes and into our homes to make us think that what we don't have is enough. So it's not a new problem, but I think also now we're seeing the next evolution of it with online media, with social media, right? There's, there's this whole culture now of influencers who, I mean, cool job, you get paid to, like, use products and seemingly in a natural, normal, everyday way. From Stanley Water Bottles, the hot item of right now, that is an accessible thing to get more of, maybe you get one in every color, to higher-end items like the BMW iX Flow, which is a color-changing car... Right? Three for the price of one, friends. Right? There's, there's, there's products out there that it just seems like, oh, I, I really want that bigger, better, more. Uh, and they're not unethical things, but it does take us into this idea of consumerism. Yuval Noah Harari writes that consumerism sees the consumption of ever more products and services as a positive. It encourages people to treat themselves, spoil themselves, or even kill themselves slowly by overconsumption. In the mentality of consumerism, frugality is a disease to be cured. Consumerism normalizes constant spending. Joe Terrell puts it this way, consumerism is so much more than an advertising strategy. It's a worldview that fundamentally alters the way we approach our bodies, our relationships, our mental health, and our religion. Consumerism has not only infiltrated our understanding and application of Christianity, but is also essentially a religion in and of itself. And almost by every metric, it could be considered the most successful religion in the history of humankind. He gives these creepy examples. Our religious holidays have become excuses to shop. Ads show us the highest virtue of Christianity, which is love. Ads show us that love is best expressed through the exchange of expensive gifts. Ads show us that purpose and meaning in life can be fulfilled by a vacation on the high end, but maybe just some new running, pa- running shoes or possibly yoga pants. And suddenly your life has new meaning and purpose. You have new meaning and value if you get these products. Our temples, our malls and digital storefronts, our altars, our checkout counters and online baskets, our priests and pastors, our advertising agencies, our sacrifices are the dollars in our checking account, and our God in the midst of this religion, our God is our unmet desires. The thing we worship is what we don't have. I am very, very creeped out by his phrasing, but I don't disagree with him. I get it. But I want us to get into scripture today. We're going to be in Luke 12. Luke 12 is, uh, is it's one of my favorite passages in the Bible. In it, 
there are parables that come at us fast and furiously. We're only going to be able to look at one of them today. But if you have time this week, I encourage you to, to read the whole chapter and, and these different examples of, of the parables that Jesus tells that get into these ideas of consumerism. So we are going to start at verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. We're going to pick back up here, but let's just rest at this point right here, right? So, so Jesus is in this crowd. Somebody comes up, asks him, how do I split my inheritance? And Jesus says, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. For one's life does not consist of the abundance of possessions. The, the message translation puts it this way. Take care. Protect yourselves against the least bit of greed. Life is not defined by what you have, even when you have a lot. Now, the word consumerism isn't in scripture. It didn't exist yet. But the word greed here is getting at the same point. It, it's getting to this idea of the pursuit of more and more and more. In this, in this passage, there's a, there's a rejection, right? His friend is like rejecting the, the man, thinking about his brother. He's rejecting like, oh, well, whatever my brother says is enough. No, the, the, this man is coming to Jesus saying, what I have isn't enough. I'm concerned about enough. I'm concerned about fairness. I'm concerned about all of this above relationship. The, the word here that we read as greed in English, in the Greek, is pleonexia. And it means covetness. Uh, coveting is specifically wanting what someone else has. It also means uh, it has a, a quality of a desire for advantage and a desire for more. So it's a, it's a well-translated word. So let's pick back up. Luke 12, verse 16, because Jesus is going to not tell the man the answer. He's going to give a parable to help the man discern for himself what the answer is. Then Jesus told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things you've prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. Now, I think it's easy for us to, to pick on this guy for being such a selfish dummy, right? I mean, it's easy for us to just judge him, but the challenge, the challenge is to actually find ourselves in this. Because Jesus never told easy, surface-level stories, he, he told parables that contain timeless truths so that we can find ourselves in them. Now, it means we might have to sub out some words. We might have to change out words for barns and crops to meet our situation, our thing that we hold on tightly to. So I'm going to pick on a cultural trend here that is the fastest growing real estate market in our country. It is not beachfront homes. It is storage units. <laughs> and these are not the storage units of yesteryear, right? This is not like you go out and there's a whole roll of garages and you just lift up that door and it's just whatever temperature in there. No, 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 no. You guys have seen these cropping up, right? They are well lit. They are temperature controlled facilities with elevators. 
They are not cheap after the move-in special. The move-in special gets you. And then after that, it's trouble, right? And friends, there are certainly very legitimate reasons for having a storage unit. But how much more often could we let things go? How often could we just bless someone with it today and trust that the Lord will meet our need when it comes up again? Again, it's about heart, not about rules. So, uh, uh, right, military family growing up. I understand you don't want to give up every single thing you own every time you move. My dad was Air Force. We had a luxurious four years when we moved places, but some of, some of you folks are moving every one year or two years or three years. And, and, so, and so when we talk about letting go, it's something that is a heart thing, not just a practical thing. It's not practically wrong to do this, but we have to ask ourselves what's going on in our hearts. Because this is my question, right? In a storage unit, sometimes we're holding on to our sense of security or we're holding on to, to old things that are, that are burdening us or we think that our future is in those things. But when we, when we look at it as a cultural trend, here's what we have, right? We have the Earth's limited resources to heat and cool and light being used to hold excess stuff that we can't even fit in our own houses, which are getting increasingly larger and larger. Friends, as a culture, we will heat and cool and light up stuff, but we have a homelessness epidemic. We will heat and cool our old collectibles, but not a human being. And as a culture... We have to look at this. This is why consumerism is a cute but deadly kind of ism. Now, it's not wrong to have, to have things, right? A little bit later in this, a parable we're not going to dive into today, but a little bit later in this same passage, Jesus tells a, a parable about having generous oil to provide hospitality, to be ready. It's not about the stuff that Jesus has the problem with. It's about the heart. And sometimes our love of stuff actually clouds our heart. Be on your guard against all kind of greed, for life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, do I have my stuff or does my stuff have me? And I think we should all say that together. Do I have my stuff or does my stuff have me? In the year 1835, Alex de Tocqueville wrote a work called Democracy in America. And he wrote this. Americans, though living among the happiest circumstances of any people in the world, are followed by a cloud that habitually hangs over their heads. A cloud that makes them serious, even sad, in the midst of their pleasures. Though they have cause for celebration, they never stop thinking of the good things they have not got. 200, almost 200 years ago, <laughs> preaches today, right? Consequently, he continues on. So, so Norma Weir's been a, a, th a theologian. He, he writes a little commentary on this, uh, summarizing de Tocqueville. Consequently, we pursue prosperity with a feverish ardor, tormented by the suspicion that we have not chosen the quickest or shortest path to get it. We clutch everything but hold nothing fast and so lose grip as we hurry after some new delight. Were de Tocqueville alive today, we would not have to change those words very much, perhaps actually adding that the intensity of our desire is more, the scope of our holding tight is more, and the depth of our dissatisfaction may actually be more. So what do we do? What do we do to combat the ism of consumerism, which is, a, which is a cultural problem, as well as a personal struggle for many? Well, I want us to consider three qualities that can help us. 
The first is generosity. Generosity requires an awareness of others. Professor Dorothy Jean Weaver points out that, that in Luke 12, the rich farmer expresses no need for anyone beyond himself. He doesn't consult any outside parties. He speaks only to himself. He doesn't consider alternative options for resolving his difficulties. He doesn't think to maybe share his wealth for those who have need. That's nowhere in his thinking. His vision extends only to himself and his personal retirement fund. The possessions of the rich farmer have closed his eyes to the world around him. He can't even see in his vision those in need. Now, thankfully, Scripture is not shy about telling us what generosity looks like. If, if you were here with us a year ago, we had a whole sermon series on this. And if you were not here, I encourage you on our Facebook page or on YouTube, you can check out our Growing Generosity sermon series where we went into these ideas in depth. But just to give a little summary and reminder today, Scripture tells us time and time again that everything belongs to God. God lets us be stewards of it, but it's really God's. And so, and so if we get to hold it all, what is our responsibility? Well, the Old Testament talks about the tithe, and tithe literally is a word that means 10%. And so that's the standard of giving that's given forth in the Old Testament. You take your first 10% of what you bring in uh, for the farmer in their culture, it would have been grain. Uh, for us, most of us, that would mean money because we're not in a manufacturing or, or farming job. And then we get into the New Testament, and the New Testament doesn't cancel the old stuff. The New Testament raises the bar. So uh, the New Testament asks us to love others as we love ourselves. I will let you all figure out the math of that because that's scary. But more important than a number is growing in generosity. So if your budget doesn't have a percentage of generosity in it already, grow in it. If you are already a, a faithful tither, great, grow in it. I, I do believe there are blessings in life that come when we obey God on this. It's right, you guys have heard me say before, God is not our, our Coke machine. We don't say, here's my tithe up in the top of the machine, out comes exactly what I want out the bottom. That's not how it works. But when we focus on this and we say, God, I'm, okay, this is what it says in scripture, I'm going to do it. It reorients our whole brain and our, and, our, and our posture towards what we have toward God. And I see again and again from your stories and, and in my own life what God does when we, when we listen to God on this. So, so whatever, wherever you're at, right? Whether it's $10 a week or, or 10% or a little extra when you have it. Think about how do you grow in generosity. But generosity isn't just about our money. It is also about our stuff. It's also about our time. But I want to I pause here thinking about our stuff. Okay, has anybody heard of death, the deathbed test or Swedish death cleaning? Okay, super morbid names. Yeah, okay, a couple of you have. Yeah, super morbid name. But this is fascinating stuff. The idea in Swedish death cleaning is that you imagine your loved ones having to clean up after you have passed. Now, how many of you have lived through that, right? You've lived through somebody you love passing and you have to go and sort it. It's just, I don't know, for me, it was just awful. I mean, it just is so stressful. You have to figure out what was dear to that person, what wasn't. I opened up a, a, my mom's cedar chest, and she had every greeting card she had ever received in her entire life. And I actually mean baby cards that she got when she was in her mother's womb. That was such a burden for me, this emotional burden. How do you get rid of that for someone else? You know, like... I just put it in the recycle bin, but I like, I was really torn up about it, right? So in this idea, we think about blessing 
the, the next generation of our friends or our family who will have this responsibility. And so we, as the person who has the stuff, take on this burden while we are alive to bless them. But in that, in that we also release our stuff. Because friends, do I have my stuff or does my stuff have me? This is the question we have to be asking ourselves. Get rid of what you can Bless them with it, with, with it now. Later in Luke 12, Jesus reminds us that our treasure is in heaven, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. Uh, the bigger, bigger barns farmer dude, he, he shows us we can't take it with us. It only lasts as long as our life, so we can live well with it. The, the second quality that helps us combat consumerism is gratitude. Gratitude for what you already have. So friends, think about the things that you already have and really enjoy them. Touch them. Use the things. If it's edible, you know, like eat it. Don't, I don't know, you guys do this? Like you have the very special thing that it just sits for maybe the, the special event. Eat it, enjoy it, relish it. And relish in the abundance that you already have. Scripture describes God as a God of abundance. And we get into a scarcity mentality that we don't have enough. Then we, then we focus, we hyper-focus on, on what we don't have instead of what we do have. And we miss out on the opportunity to taste and see that the Lord is good. So practice gratitude. Notice and name the things that you're grateful for each day. It's a great habit. Just pick what time of day you're going to do it and do it. Another thing you can do is when you pray, every time you pray, just stop and give God thanks first. I mean, ask what you're going to ask. Cry out in the way you're going to cry out. Those are good things. Don't stop doing those things. But just take the opportunity to thank God. And it's a challenge. Sometimes you're praying for something really heavy and you're thinking, how in the world do I find something to thank God for in the midst of this? Sometimes it's even just thanking God. Thank you, God, that I can, I can lay out my heart to you anywhere at any place and time. But that attitude of gratitude, I know it's like kind of kitschy to say it, but it really does help us to combat consumerism. And then last of all is the character quality of contentment. In order to live in contentment, one of the most important things you can do is avoid comparison. So what do you need to do to avoid comparison? It's, it's going to be different. For each person, uh, sometimes just it's some generational things. For some, for some folks, it's uh, it's like the home the home magazines that make everything in the house look perfect, beautiful. You need all of these things, or you need all of these tools. I was a proud recipient of Home Handyman for many a year, and it was constantly showing us the things in our house that weren't fixed. Um, Home shows on TV or car shows on TV, they're great entertainment, but if they get us focused on what we don't have, they're not serving us. Social media does this in a huge way. And so if there is an influencer that you're, that you're following, just you need to have an awareness of is this person trying to sell me something? How did they get this thing that they're showing do I really need it? Uh, do I want to wait two weeks or two months before I engage it instead of just wanting it and focusing on it and hyper fixating on it? Or maybe you have a group of friends and whenever you get together, the topic of conversation is always about the more, the bigger, the better, the next thing. And so you might need a, a pause from that group of friends or figure out how to steer the conversation a different way. Something that uh, a lot of people will do in January that's a bit of a kind of a social media trend is buy nothing January. Well, it's February, uh, but we could still do a buy nothing February. Hey, it's shorter than January, so that's good. But this is an idea where you stop buying things. Now, you don't stop giving, but you stop buying things. So instead of eating out, you eat your freezer clear of food. 
Instead of going and buying clothes, you just keep wearing the ones you have, and maybe in that month you figure out what can I clear out uh, so when I do want to shop again, you know, there's space. I know the things I really am and I'm not doing. And so it's, I love it when people do buy nothing January. It's super fun to hear people's stories. It may mean you invite somebody over to watch uh, a show or movie instead of going to a movie theater. It's great. Um, so that's an idea. Proverbs 3, 9 through 10 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth with the first fruits of all your crops. That's a reference to tithing. And then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Okay, now this comes from Proverbs, not promises. Okay, so this is not a promise that if you honor the Lord with your wealth, give your first fruits, then you're gonna have an abundance, right? It's not, it's not a promise, but it is wisdom to say, put God first, hold the, the values that Christ himself had of generosity, of gratitude, of contentment, and you will feel rich. I want to give you one last word on contentment. It's from Philippians 4.11. Paul says, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in living or plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. I love that. I have learned to be content in whatever the circumstance. And Paul went from being on top, well-looked-on, good reputation, well-resourced, to humbly following the Lord, being jailed, being persecuted, being looked down on. But throughout that, he had contentment because his contentment was not in the things he didn't have, but was in the richness of what he had. And what did he have, friends? He had Jesus with him at all times. That was his secret. His secret was to focus on Jesus. His secret was to trust that God could work through any circumstance, even when it doesn't match up with the world's image of success. And the great news about Paul's secret is that he didn't keep it to himself. He used his life to tell others about Jesus and to tell others that that following the Lord is our secret to contentment as well. It's for everyone. So let's go to the Lord now in prayer. God, we come before you today, and we want to take that challenge to start with gratitude. And so, God, we, we come in gratitude, and, and we thank you. We thank you for the ability to be here this morning, the ability to have heat in this place uh, for these hours that we're here together, God. We thank you for a fellowship of believers, for our brothers and sisters in Christ who can encourage us along this journey. God, we thank you for our life and our breath. God, I thank you within this church family for the way that you are at work, God. And, and as I continue to have conversations with people around, around baptism, God, I, I just am so grateful. I'm so grateful that you are with us through the highs and lows of life so faithfully. And God, I think about how that reflects Paul's journey. That when he was a have, when he had everything, Lord, he loved God, but he didn't, he didn't get Jesus. He didn't, he didn't understand the example of Jesus. And God, when he committed himself to following Jesus Christ, when he called Jesus his Savior, Lord, it wasn't a prosperity gospel. It didn't lead to his popularity. It didn't lead to his wealth. But it let 
It led him to a, to a trueness of a spirit that fulfilled his heart and helped others to know Jesus. And I just can't ask anything else for us today than that. God, I pray that you, that you meet our physical needs for those among us, God. I pray that you meet our emotional needs, our psychological needs, God. But more than all of that, I pray, I pray, God, that you would give each person here a, a, a saving knowledge of you, of Jesus Christ, that, that you died on the cross for our sins and then you beat death and you, and you rose again, Lord, and that you are with us through the highs and the lows of our all life with such great faithfulness. God, I pray that, that like Paul, we can just cling to you and find our contentment in you, God. You care more about our holiness than our happiness, and it's not that you don't want us to be happy. You give blessings, and you are a God of abundance, but God, at the end of the day, you want our holiness. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to that, that you would help grow in us generosity and gratitude and contentment when it comes to material things, Lord, so that then we can be focused spiritually on trusting you, on relying on you to meet our needs, on seeing miracles of how you show up in unexpected ways, God. You're a good God. We love you and we thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.